Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome tonight. We have with us Dr. David Limbrick, and he is a pediatric neurosurgeon, and he also sees adults, actually, out at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he's been on our seaboard for several years, and um, he's doing a lot of really cool research in Chiari and syringomyelia. So I thought today we could maybe focus a little bit more on the state of Chiari research and um, where we've been and I guess where we're kind of going. Sure. Well, uh, thanks, Caitlin. Uh, so um, as uh, Caitlin said, I'm David Lindbrick. I'm at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, primarily a pediatric neurosurgeon. I have been on the faculty uh, of our hospital now for about 12 or 13 years. Um, I do uh, also see quite a few um, adults uh, with uh, these disorders, Chiari and syringomyelia. And um, uh, so my practice is not exclusively pediatrics. I do uh, run a couple of um, larger uh, research efforts within the world of Chiari and syringomyelia. Uh, one is called the Park Reeves Syringomyelia Research Consortium. Um, and that's a, a consortium of, of about 42 different hospitals and uh, we um, conduct clinical research primarily on children with Chiari and syringomyelia. Also, I, um, uh, as related to that, I help to coordinate a genetic study that sort of uh, works on some of the infrastructure of Park Reeves. Uh, one of the, the greatest joys that in my own career has been um, working uh, with the uh, uh, Dorothy, Caitlin, Mary, and the rest of uh, Bobby Jones, uh, um, uh, uh, Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation, uh, and um, uh, in, in working on the Scientific and Educational Advisory Board. Uh, so that, that's been a, a great joy for me, and, and uh, looking at the research efforts that have uh, grown out of that, uh, which I think we'll probably talk a little bit about uh, today, which uh, include uh, some of the multi-center uh, efforts that are um, have been planned for some time, but really are starting to take off now. Um, so I would say that the things that really got me interested in this field um, really was when I started uh, a few years back that very little was known about a very, very important and disabling disease. And uh, it seemed like uh, this was an area where uh, one could apply themselves and have a, a great effect. Um, and you know, that certainly comported with my experience and mainly at that point, pediatric neurosurgery when I was seeing children uh, with, uh, with these problems and yet very little was known about how to treat them uh, and, um, and, and why they develop. Okay. Um, great. I guess I'll kind of start since you referenced it already, and it's it's really a, an important part of how Chiari research has advanced. Um, can you just kind of describe what the Park Reeves database is? How did it get started? And um, really, what is it, I guess? Well, as um, a lot of different things uh, in medicine um, and kind of uh, come to pass, a lot of it starts with just one or two patients and some philanthropy. And so I was uh, fortunate to um, be at WashU when um, a family made a donation to our university uh, to start this multi-center uh, uh, research consortium. And uh, so that, uh, that family had a, a child uh, who had Chiari and syringomyelia and scoliosis and had uh, been around the country, this is years ago, um, and really the presenting sign or the, the reason that they found out about it was the scoliosis. So they had been around and seen a number of different um, orthopedic surgeons who work with spinal deformity. And um, ultimately um, they uh, were referred and an MRI scan was done that re revealed the sort of the the root cause, which was Chiari and syringomyelia. And uh, so that patient actually um, was treated and, you know, uh, ultimately had um, all the, the different things that we think about with Chiari and syringomyelia and scoliosis, needed to have um, multiple fusion procedures. And um, they said, hey, listen, we'd like to give back. Uh, we'd like to see uh, if you can help figure out how to best um, 
mainly at that point, they wanted to focus on how we can uh, de define the best treatments for Chiari and syringomyelia. And so we started with um, five or 10 sites um, and we focused on uh, radiology tests and, and clinical information. So we collected um, uh, clinical information from every patient who came through our hospital, but over over time it grew to five hospitals and then ten hospitals and you know it just kept growing and 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 the surgeons themselves and the patients across the country really wanted to sort of contribute and be a part of this and uh, we just happened to be there at the right time and fortunately through philanthropy had the backing to to make some inroads and um, so we created this database that as I said now is 42 different institutions and we collect everything from you know, birth history, uh, to some extent, even the maternal history, um, uh, in utero complications and things like this. Um, and then uh, all the different uh, medical problems that happen throughout uh, a, a child's life. Um, then we collect all the MRI scans and they're archived. Um, and then we look at how they were treated and how they did, if they had complications, um, if they uh, went on to develop scoliosis or need a fusion procedure, uh, if they were treated with a brace rather than a fusion. And we were able to sort of collect data on, at this point, about 1,600 uh, patients with Chiari and Syringomyelia across North America. And then we sort of uh, were able to kind of leverage that data to try to ask questions like, for example, um, what is the natural history of scoliosis in Chiari and syringomyelia? Uh, in other words, does it progress? Uh, what happens when we operate on children when they're younger versus when they're older? Are we more likely to have uh, an effect? Um, and uh, then, you know, with all the MRIs and X-rays and CTs archived, we were able to look at uh, trying to correlate uh, radiographic findings with clinical findings and outcomes. And um, that's sort of what we've been doing recently. Um, Bobby Jones CSF uh, has been a, a partner in uh, what one of our largest research efforts to date, which is uh, trying to run a randomized control trial uh, to compare uh, whether or not uh, a surgeon would open the dura, which is that layer that contains the spinal fluid and the spinal cord and so forth, uh, that so-called spinal sac, um, or or leave it closed and just decompress it, and so. That uh, question of whether you open the dura and uh, sew in a graft, which is known as duraplasty, is one of sort of these controversial uh, questions, at least in pediatric neurosurgery. And um, so we've been, uh, um, we did finish a randomized control trial uh, on this. And I have to say, um, as you know, I've given a few talks about this trial over time, and I really need to give credit where. It's due, and that is um, with uh, Bobby Jones CSF for helping us as a partner in that trial and helping us to um, communicate with patients, to recruit patients, uh, and to help um, address any concerns that the patient community might have with respect to participating in a trial like that. So maybe I'll just take a second and let you know where that trial is. Uh, we finished enrolling, um, and we actually have finished all the follow-up on those patients. Um, and we are tabulating the data now and going back and sort of what we call cleaning the data, making sure that all the data is in the right spot and we have all the uh, images that we need. And um, I, I think our final report is due here in a few months. Um, and actually because of the pandemic, uh, the funding agency, which is the CORI or the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, has uh, given us an extra six months because at our institution, as with many institutions, clinical research was uh, closed down and remains so right now. Um, but uh, all the data had already been collected, so the data itself won't be affected, of course. It's just a, a matter of getting everybody back into the office to analyze it. So um, anyway, so I would say that's been our, our largest effort to date. And again, I, I do want to acknowledge Bobby Jones CSF as really sort of uh, 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 being a major factor in the success of that trial. Um, so really, I would say that the way I link it is uh, philanthropy, um, uh, helping to build a team of researchers that involve patients and patient advocates like Bobby Jones. And, uh, and then once all that infrastructure is in place, using it to leverage um, 
the funding agencies like the NIH and PCORI and other funding agencies to support these major trials. I think we're getting a lot of really good questions about the trial. So I kind of want to take like seven steps back and just say, right. <laughs> um, basically, up, I'm going to walk through kind of what I think is really important. So first of all, what is a duroplasty? What is a bone only decompression? Um, what are the different anatomical things that you're doing to that area that make right, them different? Right. Yet? And then um, right. what are you comparing really? to start. Right. That's a, that, that's a great question. I'm sorry I wasn't a little bit more clear about that. But, uh, but basically, the way, uh, the way we generally do uh, um, a Chiari decompression is we make an incision sort of uh, along the upper portion of the neck, the lower portion of the skull there. Um, and uh, we, um, depending on the MRI and the age of the child and a number of other factors, we remove the back portion of the base of the skull. That's the frame and magnum. Oftentimes, we also remove just the back portion of, uh, of the first bone in the neck, that's cervical one or C1. Sometimes we have to go a little bit lower or um, just based on the child's individual anatomy. I did see one other question uh, with respect to the, to the trial. The trial is zero to 21 years of age, but um, I'd like to believe that the results that we have there will be applicable to everyone. Uh, so. Um, once the bone is removed, um, then there are some restrictive ligaments on top of this spinal sac, which is the dura. Um, the dura is one of the key uh, coverings of the brain and spinal cord, but also contains the fluid uh, through a variety of other related membranes. Um, so uh, once we've taken this re restrictive uh, ligament off, um, then uh, the operation can be stopped, and that's a so-called extradural uh, or bone-only operation. Um, and uh, uh, so in, in the trial, that was described exactly how to do that, so we didn't have a lot of different surgeons doing it a lot of different ways, and we had videos to help everybody to understand how, you know, how we should be comparing these things. Um, and so that's the extradural or bone-only operation, and I think most people would say, well, um, you know, it's possible that the bone-only operation is not as effective um, because the goal of surgery is to create more decompression here. And by removing bone and this little additional ligament, uh, it's possible that, that the decompression is not adequate or is not uh, allowing fluid flow through um, uh, that deepest portion underneath those spinal layers, uh, underneath the dura. Um, and so, um, uh, in, in, in that situation, a surgeon can consider sort of a second stage to the operation where they open that dura, again, that spinal sac up, um, and um, evaluate for any scarring or layers of tissue that may be uh, affecting the fluid flow from the brain down into the spine or, or, um, or from the spine to the brain. Um, and... Um, and so in this second stage, the duraplasty, we open up that spinal sac, the dura. Uh, oftentimes we'll use a microscope to look for any sort of adhesions or, or tissue that may be blocking or interrupting the flow. And then sewing in a graft material, and I'll circle back on that in just one second. Uh, and by sewing in that graft material, you can actually very much augment the amount of space and decompression uh, and allow fluid to flow more freely up and uh, down. Uh, so, so that is that duroplasty operation. And if the shortcoming of the bone only operation is that the decompression may or may not be adequate, the shortcoming of the uh, duroplasty operation would be that it does carry some risk and those risks, risks include leakage of cerebrospinal fluid um, or uh, a reaction uh, to either blood or the graft material, which can cause some inflammation, and that is what we call a chemical meningitis, not a true meningitis like an infection, but uh, it uh, certainly can feel uh, uncomfortable to the patient. Or fluid can accumulate underneath uh, the skin there, uh, and that's called a pseudomeningocele. And those are sort of the three key complications. There are others, of course. It's more invasive. There is some risk, uh, additional risk to the for example, the spinal cord and brainstem, but but really when we think about it, it's those risks of um, of uh, leakage of fluid, uh, 
um, infection or a chemical meningitis or a so-called pseudomeningocele, again, fluid accumulation underneath the uh, skin. So, so each of those two operations, the bone only, may be less effective in decompression, but probably has a less risk profile. And the uh, duraplasty operation probably offers better decompression, but carries with it risk. And so um, the clinical trial that we ran together with Bobby and CSF was uh, randomizing patients across uh, 42 different centers uh, to one or the other operation, and uh, and then looking not just at complications, but uh, how patients do in terms of their clinical symptoms, whether they're syrinx. Now, all, all these patients did have a syrinx. That's an important, very important factor. A syrinx, again, is that fluid collection within the spinal cord that commonly happens in the setting of Chiari. Um, and, uh, and so we look at syrinx uh, complications, uh, clinical outcomes, meaning how did, how did you fare in terms of your symptoms, um, and then quality of life using some um, very specific quality of life metrics. And, and I, uh, I've been trying not to look at the text going by. I hope Caitlin's been doing that. But uh, uh, one of the questions that I did see spin by are, are what are the results? And um, so the results I will have for you the next time uh, I'm invited to come and give a talk, which will probably be at least uh, from, from the standpoint of the results six months or so from now. Okay. Well, that's really good. Um, I do want to kind of spend some time on the randomization process, just because I know there is a little bit of talk about that was kind of scary, um, the idea of being randomized to a surgery. Um, pe people obviously are a little bit uneasy about that. So just before we get into some more of the other stuff about the trial, like maybe you want to talk a little bit about how that was determined. Sure. So first of all, let me tell you, I think that um, as neurosurgeons, we all think we know the best thing to do. That's the, that, that's in our blood, in our DNA. Um, that you know, I was trained to do it this way, so this is the way I do it. This is the way it works. My my outcomes are great. My complications are low. Um, so that that's what we all believe. Um, and so if you go and see a neurosurgeon um, outside of this trial, you know, oftentimes they'll say, this is the way I do the operation, this is the way it's gotta be done, um, this is the best way to do it, and, and it could be, um, or it may not be. And uh, so a lot of the data prior to these um, research efforts that I've been talking to you about, um, uh, a lot of the data was based on one surgeon's belief or a small group of surgeons belief of how they're doing. And of course, that they themselves are the ones that are judging the outcomes, so they have a bias there. So uh, the rationale behind doing a randomized controlled trial is that you take the surgeon's bias out of it, uh, and also you very rigorously, across a bunch of different medical centers and surgeons, um, at, uh, very test it in a random way. Now, so the typical way an RCT, or randomized clinical trial, is done is you go into the operating room, your child in this case goes into the operating room, and they don't actually use a coin, uh, but but um, it's a virtual or electronic coin toss where um, whether or not you get the duraplasty or the bone only would be decided randomly by a computer-driven coin toss in the operating room. No, we didn't, we didn't do that. Um, and the reason is we felt like um, Number one, that wasn't fair uh, to patients to not know until they were in there. Um, and we felt like the surgeons may um, not be as willing to participate and may redirect in the operating room um, in a way that would allow us to sort of be taking a step back towards that individual surgeon bias. So we constructed it in something other than a coin toss. It was called a cluster randomized control trial where we, instead of randomizing by patient, coin toss per patient, we randomized by center. So one center would be randomized to doing the extradural or bone only operation, and another center would be uh, randomized to, to be doing the duraplasty. And again, all, all the different techniques were video uh, instructed. Um, and uh, so that, that, I think, did cause some consternation on the part of some uh, parents in this case, and, and I certainly understand that we did we did finish the enrollment, and uh, and and the advantage is uh, 
um, that now we're really going to have the answer and it's going to be objective. We're going to know. Um, and I think that a lot of families, you know, a lot of families were a little reluctant to do it. Others would say, listen, there's really not much information out here. We've got to know the answer to this. And uh, for my own child and for the, the child, the next child that develops this disease, we've just got to know, and I want to be part of that. And so a lot of people were really gracious and generous and, and uh, did do that. We ended up randomizing about 165, I think 164 patients. Um, our target was 148, so we did better than we expected. And uh, we, our goal was to get one year follow-up data on every one of those children, and we were able to do that. Um, so again, that's where we are, is now looking at that data. So we're excited about that. You know, the second phase, which is something that Bobby Jones uh, has been helping us with, is a longer term study of these same 164 patients where we can see not just in um, one, um, not just in, in one um, uh, year follow up, but in multiple year follow up, what exactly that we're going to do um, and how the patients are going to do long term. Uh, so that that is one thing uh, that we're really interested to see is not, again, these are children for the most part. So we're we're interested in one-year follow-up, but we're also interested in three and five-year follow-up, and and so that's going to be interesting so to see if you know if maybe they didn't have a revision surgery in the first uh, 11 months, but they did at 14 months or at two years or three years, and or did they end up needing some other complicated procedure, or or did they do great, or using quality of life metrics, did they um, do well for a year and a half, but then you know, three years later, they were uh, struggling again. So so that is the next phase, and that's what we're working on right now. That kind of touches on, uh, there was a question about, would would you expect a patient with a bone or like decompression to then need another surgery, maybe getting into the dura there? And um, uh, there was actually a really interesting question, and I, I obviously it's not going to be the result of the trial, but maybe just your own experience. Are, the compli every time you have that surgery, are you at greater risk of a complication in that way, even if it's just a duroplasty? Simple. Um, so I'll, I'll answer both of those. I, I would say that um, the the risk of needing a duroplasty after a an extradural or bone only operation, we don't know. Um, that's the easy answer. We don't know. Uh, it it probably you, you're probably more likely to need a revision after extradural, uh, but but we don't know the answer to that. Um, likewise, you're probably more likely to have a risk of one of those complications that I mentioned with the duroplasty operation. So that's that's the big decision. Um, with with respect to um, um, needing a revision long term, I, I think you know. Um, the one thing that we are finding uh, without uh, giving too much of the data away, because I'm actually blinded as the principal investigator, but it does seem like um, that uh, that the numbers are going to be um, different than what we anticipated. We designed the trial based on the, the, the data in the literature, um, and uh, some of the numbers are going to be a little bit surprising. I'll just say that as a teaser. I did see uh, something spin by something that spun by about syrinx, and our primary outcome, just with the way that the grant was uh, designed, is surgical complications. But our secondary outcomes include clinical outcome, meaning responsive headaches, uh, and and also syrinx size. And then our tertiary outcome was the quality of life. And 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 this is for the uh, clinical trialists in the group, with which there probably aren't many, but um, but the, the study is powered for all of those outcomes. So um, just as a follow-up to that, uh, they were talking about syrinx volume change, since that might be an objective measure of outcome. Um, and Wisconsin, they found right. the degree to which PCMR, I'm sure you're reading this, PCMR measured right. axial flow around C1, C2. We were able to quantify, it seemed to correlate, but it was only 40 patients. So I don't know if you can comment. 
Sure, we, we do have, um, everybody was required to have a spine MRI scan that included uh, at least through the thoracic spine in order to be able to get volumetrics or, or um, spine volumes from every patient before and after surgery. So we definitely have that. Uh, we did not require uh, CSF flow studies, which are those phase contrast CSF flow studies. Many of them, uh, uh, many of the studies have them, but not every single one. And part of that has to do with the study design since we were um, you know, not asking for funding for study-related MRI sequences. Um, and because of that, um, you know, we had to go what, with, with what was clinically indicated and also what the insurance companies, and that was variable across different uh, geographic regions, would, uh, would, would essentially cover as standard care. So I would say the majority of patients have that phase contrast CSF flow, but, but, but not everyone. Okay. Um, before we move on, uh, there are two questions that came up that I just kind of want to touch on. One was about, well, it wasn't really about this, but it's mentioned, and I think it's good to ask. So in the PFD trial, was resection of the tonsils something that was standard, or is that um, something that was not specifically not included um, to standardize that method? So we, we uh, recorded uh, coagulation or resection of tonsils. We recorded um, lysis of adhesions and this very specific study uh, or sort of neurosurgical thing called an arachnoid veil. We, we recorded all of those. We didn't require it because we felt like uh, that the surgeon needed to be permitted to make a, a good decision based on each individual patient. But be, because those things are all important factors, we did record that data. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then, Question. Uh, I think I actually already asked. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. So it was kind of about consent. So we were talking about the randomization and how the parents might feel about that. So there was a question, are the parents informed that there's no medical reason behind a decision to do one uh, surgery or another? And I, I feel like that would be right. pretty standard, but I don't know if you want to. Well, you know, actually, I think I think that's why the the families that um, and actually Bobby James helped helped us make a couple of videos about this, and one of them was made, and the other one was not made because of my own. Um, uh, I, I edited it a, a little bit differently, and anyway, long story, but um, but I'll tell you, the the families that I saw wanted to participate primarily because there was no good data. Um, and so, so most of them saw them saw themselves contributing to um, the disease uh, itself by uh, by contributing their child's data um, because there's no information out there that's high quality to let us know which operation to do. And it, it's actually it's pretty rare to be able to do a randomized control trial in any neurosurgical disease. There are a few of them out there. Um, but they're hard, and the reason is that these diseases, for the most part, are uncommon, and they're variable. And so um, we we did what we could to provide the best data for uh, generations of children to come, um, and we tried to answer as many questions as we scientifically scientifically could. Of course, we can't answer every question. One question that I I did want to address, but I know has not come up yet, at least that I haven't seen, is what is the graft material uh, that was used uh, in the trial? And, um, and so um, I think that uh, the majority of patients had autograft, which is a little piece, generally a pericranium taken from a scalp incision uh, uh, just above. Uh, 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 and, but it was permitted in the trial to have either um, uh, a, an allograft, which is um, usually from a cadaver, or uh, from um, uh, a bovine, which is a sort of almost like an, an animal-based collagen product. Uh, and all those were permitted, we, we recorded it, uh, but the mass, vast majority had the, allograph, sorry, had the autograft, which is the patient's own uh, pericranium, which is again, a little tissue from up here. No, that's actually, that's a good point. I didn't even think to ask that. Um, 
Caitlin, can I, I, I just wanted, I, I wanted to at least uh, say that one other thing that as part of Park Reeves and Bobby Jones um, that we've been doing before we move on to CCRN and CSS um, is uh, what we've been doing most recently is not just talking about uh, what treatments are best, but trying to understand what, uh, why patients develop Chiari and syringomyelia in, in the first place, and or Chiari, I should say. Um, and so one of the things, and I, I'm going to share a, a, an early result here. It's very exciting for us, actually. Um, what we've done is we've collected uh, DNA on about a thousand patients and their relatives um, across a big a multi institutional multi-continent uh, research group and um, you know these days you can sequence the genome uh, relatively uh, quickly and uh, if you um, if you just look at the parts of the genome that are actually producing proteins and other important things uh, that's called the um, really what we call that is whole exome sequencing and so instead of sequencing the entire genome, what we're trying to do is sequence the relevant parts of the genome. And that can make it a little bit less expensive, but certainly much more quick to understand what relevant gene changes could be contributing to the development of Chiari. And uh, we've actually found some really interesting things. Um, and so this is, we've just recently submitted a paper to be published on this, but uh, one of the things that we're looking at is uh, you know, that I think we've all sort of known it. Um, certainly um, some of the scientists and surgeons have known it. Uh, but it turns out that Chiari is a very diverse disease. Um, and uh, there are all sorts of different things that may contribute. And what we're doing is now we're seeing that there are different phenotypes. And a phenotype is how your genetic uh, data is sort of expressed in your body. And sometimes we can use an MRI scan to understand phenotype, or sometimes it's how your disease actually um, sort of presents to you, uh, neck pain, for example. Um, but what we're finding is there are different groups of genes that cause different phenotypes. Uh, so in other words, um, I think we all hear about hypermobility, and that certainly is one genetic uh, class um, or class of genes that seems to contribute in, in, in the pathogenesis or the development of Chiari, but there are others. And these are the exciting ones that we hadn't really thought too much about. Now, one that we have thought about is those that disrupt fluid, now uh, brain fluid or cerebrospinal fluid and how it process, how it moves. That's another class of uh, genes uh, that, uh, that can be um, the cause of hydrocephalus, sorry, of Chiari. You know, one of the things that we frequently see is hydrocephalus in the setting of Chiari. And so how do those two things relate? Well, so now we have a, a group of genes that sort of is in that hypermobility classification. Now we have one that is more sort of in the uh, uh, fluid dynamics sort of classification. Now we have one that is sort of in the development of the spine. Okay, so uh, we know that disorders of the spine, including scoliosis and something called clipophile, uh, other things. Uh, sometimes there are uh, developmental uh, variations in the way that the junction of the head and the spine occur. Uh, and, then, and then even, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, genes that regulate skull development can cause Chiari. Uh, and then there's the one that is were very surprising to me, which is brain overgrowth syndromes. And so we have a few new genes where the brain, you know, we always say it in the clinic, well, Chiari happens because either your brain has outpaced the skull or because your skull is not keeping up with the brain. And it turns out that there are genetic uh, uh, variations where the brain may just outpace the skull. So it really is a brain overgrowth. And one of the things we, we most recently did is we took one of these genes that we learned from um, uh, from the Human Genetics Project that probably many of you have contributed to. Thank you. Um, and uh, we were able to use, uh, and you may have heard this technology on um, you know CNN and New York Times or wherever, but we've used, been using CRISPR uh, to look at individual genes in, in zebrafish models. So uh, we were able to take some of these human gene findings 
and using CRISPR technology, express it in a zebrafish. And if, sure enough, the zebrafish developed what I'll call zebrafish chiari. So, uh, but 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 that that connection between having clinical data from uh, you know uh, patients, and if they uh, are, are interested in contributing their DNA, and then understanding how the gene in that particular patient um, develops into Chiari uh, can be linked back with how is it treated. So, for example, you could imagine taking that genetic data and trying to understand, well, is this somebody who's better off getting an extradural decompression or a duroplasty, uh, or should they be uh, not being treated with a posterior fossa decompression to start with? Will they be likely to need a fusion down the road? Will they be likely to need scoliosis? Uh, will they be likely to need a shunt? Um, or maybe even it's a venous outflow, in other words, a blood outflow problem. So these are all really, really interesting things, uh, at least to me, um, about how Chiari is developing and and ultimately, and we're not there yet, but but how best to treat it. So it's taking that randomized control trial and, and pushing it forward a few notches actually to understand not just what the best treatment is, but what's the best treatment for your child. And that's what we're working at. That's that's really interesting. It's almost like you're on your way. I obviously we're at the starting line, but you're on your way to a precision right. medicine treatment for Chiari, which is really fascinating. Um Right, right. I'm really glad you brought that up though, because that was actually one of my questions that I wanted to ask you, some of the genetic stuff that you guys are doing. I know are you guys still enrolling in the human genetics? trial or no yes uh, in fact that's that's not <laughs> time limited like the, like the randomized control trial it's almost like a seed or a plant but um, um, yeah no that's an ongoing ongoing project that um, is is actually uh, also funded through philanthropy so we're fortunate to have that that's good um, ooh, this is a good question um, this is going to get off track, but so is there any research being done to analyze the minority of patients who have successful decompression surgery? So they've been decompressed, but they still have all of their symptoms. So I, right now, I think right they're being treated for other things down the line. But I, is there any kind of research that's going on specific to that? Yeah, I would say, first of all, I would separate that into clinical research where we're sort of trying to understand who responds to surgery and who doesn't respond to surgery. Uh, and by that, I mean clinical response, not MRI response. So I would say that's that's one thing. Um, uh, your your point or your question, if I'm to kind of read into it a little bit, is um, uh, how how best can we treat symptoms like, for example, headaches or neck pain after a successful decompression surgery? And I would say that uh, there are people looking into that from the standpoint of um, who needs a second procedure, like a revision procedure, who needs uh, a fusion procedure, which sometimes happens, in that, especially in the setting, that hypermobility that we talked about. So I'd say people are doing that. One of the things that I think is and, and this is again in sort of in the research realm, but one of the things that we've learned about is um, if I take a step back for a moment, we used to always hear things like um, as clinicians, well, you know, my thinking's just not what it used to be, or people use the term brain fog, or they might say, you know, my memory's not as good as it used to be. And surgeons would say, well, you know, the cerebellum, the cerebellum just is involved in movement and balance. None of those things are, are relevant. But in the past year, we actually have used this advanced imaging called resting state functional connectivity imaging. Now that's a mouthful, so just say resting state imaging. So, uh, And what we found is that actually small areas of the cerebellum map up here to the frontal lobes and other areas. And clearly the cerebellum has areas that are involved not just in movement and uh, motor abilities and uh, balance and so forth, but also they map to areas of executive function. Those are very important planning areas in the brain, uh, cognitive areas, sensory areas, basically. Uh, and there's a, a great paper in uh, this very nice journal called Neuron, where people have mapped these very discrete areas of the cerebellum and said, okay, this is how it's affecting the larger brain. And so I would say, to answer your question, what we're trying to do 
is understand in in any particular person what uh, areas might be affected, and that can help to know what areas might uh, might be uh, likely to improve after surgery, what areas may may not be related to Chiari, or maybe they're all related, and you know, or more decompression needs to be done. So uh, I don't have a perfect answer to your question, but but for sure we're tackling that problem. Um, and I think that the most promising technology that we have to do that is this resting state MR, which will help us to know, again, in a person who's preoperative or postoperative, whether uh, those networks are, are functioning the way that they should be. Yeah, that's so, so interesting. So, I mean, we've, we're basically getting to a point where we're realizing how little we know about the cerebellum and even that area back there. So when you do these surgeries, you don't really know what's going to get better or worse. And while we're we're still right. trying to figure out what the symptoms even are, <laughs> but it's right. really cool that we have like almost like an objective proof that there's something mapped to the frontal lobe, which is so, so cool. That's right. Um, That's right. Yeah. If you want to see that paper, it was actually, uh, you can Google it. Uh, because the way uh, the the group that did it was actually at WashU, uh, but um, the the investigator's name is Nico Dozenbach, which you know I wouldn't expect anybody but to spell that right off the back. But you can Google it because they did all the scans after midnight, so they called it the Midnight Scan Club. Um, so that, that's you can Google Midnight Scan Club and you can see that paper. It, it, it's really impressive. They have pictures, and you can see the pictures of the different areas of the cerebellum and where they map to in the brain. Very good paper. Yeah, no, I, I've actually looked it up. I, I'd really like to hear him speak about that, um, maybe at one of these for sometime soon. Yeah, um, it'd be great. There's an interesting question. I, I mean, I feel like I know what you're going to say, but speaking of what isn't known about the cerebellum, how are we so sure that the cerebellar tonsils don't have a purpose? So <laughs> there are a lot yeah. of people um not resect them what's the yeah. one uh, cauterize yeah cauterize yeah no it's it's a great question um and you, you know i think i think a lot of it is hinges on the fact that neurosurgeons uh as the primary clinicians have taken care of chiari historically uh you know we um we test for some basic neurological function uh but you know i, I think it's possible that there are subtle changes that we can't appreciate uh, that uh, could be accomplished by um, uh, by the tonsils. I, I think that if you look at this paper that I just cited, there seem to be some network connections between the tonsils and the brain. But I'll tell you, at least in, in my opinion, I, I would say that uh, um, it's certainly still within the standard of care for surgeons to be uh, treating the tonsils. I think that that's done in many, many cases. And um, uh, and I think, you know, it's possible that it's a trade-off, you know, uh, in some cases that's absolutely required to reestablish the flow up and down through that craniofacial junction just based on the individual anatomy. In other cases, it's not required. And I think, I think that's why you see people uh, having various treatments for that. Yeah. Um, I want to ask one more question about surgery specifically before I kind of talk more about some other different, even some research that you guys are doing. But is there a reason that someone would need multiple decompressions? Uh, what happens when the herniation of the tonsils, tonsils doesn't move after decompression? So what's really the um, mechanism behind that? Why didn't they go back up? Well, I think I, I would say the number one reason that people have revision surgery is probably around um, scar tissue uh, that can happen. Uh, where you know immediately after surgery the flow is established and then over time um, scar tissue happens in the area where the surgery was done um, and so I, I think that's probably one of the key reasons um, and I, I've definitely seen that I know a lot of people have seen that um, sometimes if the tonsils are not uh, treated and the flow is not adequate I know people will go back in and either cauterize or remove part of the tonsillar tissue as a revision um, uh, I would say that uh, sometimes people will even put a little drainage tube to make sure if their scar tissue does uh, occur that the fluid can continue to flow through there. Uh, that's called a, a stent. Um, these are things that are often done at, at revision. The other thing that's frequently done at revision is 
if uh, if the cerebellar tonsils continue to slump down, people will sometimes put a little titanium mesh there to to reestablish the position. Um, or in in some cases, revision requires a fusion surgery if there is um, some instability where the bones are moving on one another and that's uh, creating neck pain. Um, those are the key reasons I think uh, are, I, I may have missed uh, one or two, but those are the ones that come to mind in terms of why revisions are done. Um, and I would say one of the key things is, um, you know, that uh, is trying to buy the patient as much relief as possible. And so um, when to go in and do a revision or when not to is, it has to be sort of on an individual basis, I think. Yeah. Um, I, this is a good question. I don't know the answer. Uh, is there any research being done on cauterization of tonsils? So like long-term outcomes, does anyone have any data on that? I don't know of any specifically on that. I know that uh, there are some smaller, uh, meaning not multi-center. Um, that's not exactly true. I think there, there are one or two papers looking at um, uh, the removal of uh, of scar tissue and tonsillar, either removal or or cauterization, uh, with um, and Dr. Iskandar from Wisconsin actually I know recently published a paper on this looking at. Uh, whether scar tissue um, uh, occurs after tonsil or cauter, uh, tonsil cauterization or microsurgical dissection, and um, and my recollection is that there was not a tremendous effect there. Okay. Me meaning, sorry, let me just say what I mean by that. Me meaning that uh, it did not cause secondary complications requiring revision more often. Uh, I, I I don't recall the details about how headaches, for example, were impacted. That's fine. Um, quickly, uh, what are we learning about the comorbidities of Chiari? So I know earlier you were kind of talking when we got into the genetics about how there might be different phenotypes quote, of Chiari where people with hypermobility related or connective tissue sort of Chiari might have a different treatment plan going forward than someone who has it because, I don't know, their brain overgrew the way you were talking about it. Um, if you have a lot of comorbidities, are you less likely to do well? Is that something that I assume you're working on in the lab? Well, not the lab, but yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so I, I think the things that we see most often are um, hypermobility syndromes and EDS. And, you know, there are a variety of different kinds of EDS or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, and um, those can impact organs other than just the brain, of course. Um, you know, we can see... Uh, blood vessel dilation and so forth, um, and um, and then there's a condition uh, that is observed more and more often with Chiari, and that's POTS, which is um, essentially um, uh, positional uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and that and that is uh, instability of the autonomic nervous system or sort of the regulation of uh, blood pressure and heart rate. Um, and that can be variable in the setting of Chiari and, and when POTS is at play and sometimes hypermobility, of course. And I would say that um, in my own experience, that makes, um, makes it harder to treat when you have uh, that sort of uh, grouping of symptoms. Um, and uh, so, again, you know, I think in, what we're learning about it is that, that it exists right now, essentially this sort of grouping of disorders. And the next stage will be sort of trying to understand how best to treat each person. And, and, and that actually, when I think about um, understanding the genetic basis of this disease, understanding, for example, um, who would benefit from surgery, who doesn't benefit from surgery, but, but even just physical therapy. My understanding is that physical therapy for uh, patients with hypermobility should be done in a very different way than standard physical therapy. So instead of range of motion and stretching, you should be focusing on strengthening exercises. And um, so I think uh, having an experienced clinician, uh, but but a, a very experienced uh, physical therapist is really important in, to making sure that your recovery and your treatment is um, as uh, appropriate as possible when, when it's complicated by these other conditions. Yeah. Um, do we approach surgery differently if we know the patient's hypermobile or 
We, do yeah, we not true. know that yet? <laughs> Well, I'd say, I'd say that's a, that, that is an area of very active investigation. Um, and, uh, and I would say that, you know, as primarily a pediatric neurosurgeon, I would say that, that, that this discussion uh, is probably more um, active within the adult neurosurgery and Chiari uh, world. Um, and, um, you know, there are... Um, uh, for example, understanding the junction between um, the uh, skull and the top portion of the spine, the so-called craniovertebral junction, and how it's affected by hypermobility is one of the more controversial topics, and how we measure that even is controversial. So I won't get into the very specific measurements, but there, there are many of them, uh, and uh, there are advocates out there in the world that... Um, uh, that sort of will um, advocate everything from, you know, no surgery to just a standard Chiari decompression to something more significant, which includes a, a, a fusion procedure, for example. And I would say that um, uh, that uh, the, the the data is not great there yet. So most of most of the data uh, exists in single centers. We did just in our pediatric cohort did just. Um, uh, publish a paper looking at it in kids, but I'm not sure that that will address it for the adults where this conversation is probably more apt to occur. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just touch on something really quick because I, I know at the last colloquium, I think, we sat next to each other and I started talking about, so I look at all of this from the public health realm. So demographics and socioeconomics, um, access to care, these are all really important mm -hmm. things that I have a feeling are being understudied <laughs> um, in Chiari malformation. And I know that you said that your team was starting to look at some of the socioeconomic stuff and access to care and diagnosis and treatment. So I don't know if you wanted to, I don't know if anything's come of that yet or if yeah. you want to about it. Well, I, I can tell you that we, we have studied that a little bit. I would say that uh, there's much, much more to be done there. In our group of 1,600 patients, what we found is, and this is, I should just qualify this by saying this is under or in revision with a journal, so not published, but I'm just going to share with you pre preliminarily since I've presented on this in the past. It does seem like there are disparities in the timing uh, of presentation, meaning uh, when people get their MRI scans and when they get to see a clinician who's um, experienced in thinking about this disorder, um, and so uh, there, you know, um, I think that 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 is a problem with our healthcare system uh, that that not everybody has ready access to a pediatrician to imaging, uh, and and that causes delays uh, in care, and those delays in care complicate the care, uh, meaning uh, that um, patients who presented later. Uh, tended to have more complicated and longer hospital course. Uh, now, fortunately, uh, once they were under the care of uh, a, a Chiari expert, let's say, um, their care didn't deviate at all, um, meaning everybody got the same care once they were sort of in the hands of somebody who treats it frequently. But they did present later, and that did complicate their or affect their complication rate and their length in the hospital. So uh, definitely a, a lot of uh, work to be done in that area. Both that question uh, and the question that we just talked about a little bit before, which is um, are, are there things, particularly in the adult population, that, um, that affect outcomes long term, like for example, like we were talking about EDS or POTS or those sorts of things, those things are something that I think would be ap are really um, amenable to study through, you know, the Bobby Jones networks, which are now starting the, uh, um, you know, the uh, CSS and uh, also the um, CCRN, which is the Chiari Clinical Research Network and the Chiari Surgical Severity Score. Um, and those, you know, whereas Park Reeves has been limited to children, and children with Chiari, but also syringomyelia. I think um, that these two emerging efforts, which are very related, um, uh, uh, would give us the opportunity to look not just in kids, but at adults and, and adults with Chiari, as well as those with Chiari and syringomyelia. So I, I did want to just say that 
I think that 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 our current efforts are not tuned exactly to study uh, adults, meaning the Park Reeves, but I think that our larger efforts through Bobby Jones CSF will be, and I think that's an, an exciting thing about uh, about the emerging research efforts that you guys are advocating for. Yeah, so I mean that was going to be my next question. So I don't know if you want to. It always sounds better coming from you. So <laughs> if you want to, I don't know about that. <laughs> what maybe the sure. CSSS and the CCRN are in theory, and what we're planning to do going forward. Sure. So I, I'm um, grateful to be a part of this effort. That is, uh, I'm going to step away from my Park Reeves hat for a moment. So just to sort of say that. Uh, Park Reeves and the PFD trial, the, that's that randomized control trial that we did as partners with Bobby Jones CSF is somewhat different than these new efforts, which again are not focused on kids only and are not focused on Chiari and syringomyelia, but, but can, can involve anybody with Chiari. Um, and I think that this is uh, really an exciting time. Uh, uh, Bobby Jones CSF spent the last, I don't know, five years sort of going through and uh, identifying with experts. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm not sure if I would count myself in that group, but uh, but I was in that group. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so we we worked to identify um, the uh, the different parameters that we should be studying and the outcome measures that we need to be tracking. And, the NIH supported this. It was called the Common Data Elements, and that's just a fancy term to say that that we need to all research efforts in Chiari for this particular conversation need to be collected in the same way, uh, and we need to have uh, the same outcome metrics. So when we do a study, we know what we're talking about. We can compare things apples to apples, um, and so uh, as a follow up to that CDE project. Um, uh, Bobby Jones and you know with myself and some other physicians have uh, uh, begun to build the next phase which is a, a multi-institutional network uh, of experts around the world um, we're starting small with just a limited number of sites um, but we have plans to to build on it and uh, and really sort of um, take it to the next level and um, again uh, this is uh, Chiari, um, not just ring of myelia, but uh, Chiari, and uh, it really focuses on everything from clinical presentation to uh, MRI scan data uh, to um, how people did with surgery, uh, and and also long term looking at patients and seeing how their disease develops over time with or without surgery. Uh, so I think this is a wonderful tool. I think that uh, for those of you who don't know, Caitlin uh, is helping to lead this effort um, and is going to be sort of helping to coordinate all the data acquisition and uh, and the study conduct and everything else. So it's it's very, very exciting. The first part of that is something called the CSSS, which is the Chiari Surgical Severity Score. A lot of initials, as always, in science. And... Um, and uh, so, so that the first step is the CSSS, and it is uh, a tool that's uh, designed to help us to understand before surgery how somebody might do a surgery and how they're going to do long term. And so, this is an important thing in deciding not just who needs surgery, but but can we anticipate and help counsel people to say, well, here's what we expect. Um, um, here's how we think you might do here's you know ultimately a lot of those questions that we've been talking about with respect to what surgery is best and uh, and all those things will be um, uh, taken on but we're starting uh, with a very narrow focus just looking at this uh, severity score yeah yeah and I guess to add a little bit to that we're we're looking at a wide range of predictors so different things that is specific to the patient walking through the door that um, may just predict whether or not they're going to do better based on all the other predictor variables, variables which include the type of surgery done, the um, things that were done intraoperatively, baseline characteristics and symptoms, and all of it's going into the score. And um, that's on you guys to determine <laughs> the, 
how it all works out because I don't have to do the math, but um, yeah. I'm in, we're, we're going to work together to kind of make sure that everyone's data are complete and we can really come up with a good score for this because right now there really isn't much other than if someone walks into your clinic and you say, I mean, I've seen this happen, so <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> right, um, right, that's right. Yeah, so uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else specific. If you, anyone has any last minute questions, now's the time. Um, but I think before we move on, I just wanted to ask, um, where do you think you see, this is more of like a pie in the sky question, where do you think you see Chiari surgery going in the future? And I, I know you kind of hinted that maybe it's going towards genetics, um, but five, 10, maybe even 20 years from now, what do you think we'll know about Chiari that we didn't know today? Well, I would say that, um, you know, as you, you hear this term personalized medicine all the time now, and I think that's where we're headed. The genetics are part of that. New MRI findings, like the ones we talked about from the Midnight Scan Club, um, uh, different uh, flow-related studies that uh, we heard a little bit about earlier, um, looking at, at presentation symptoms, whether it's headaches, how those headaches look, where uh, hypermobility sort of fits in. All these things are going to help us to personalize treatments for people based on what their genetic score is, what their radiological score is, what their clinical score is, and kind of building um, uh, essentially a, a, a personalized approach. And it may not be personalized down to one particular individual, but groups of individuals. So if you're hypermobile and you have um, lax joints in the craniovertebral junction and you have, um, you know, um, a, we didn't even get into the Chiari 1.5 thing, you know, the position of the brain stem and all these other things, whether you have um, part of your C2 is impinging on your spinal cord, all those things um, are, are really sort of going to help us to build uh, a personalized approach to treatment. Uh, so I, I think that's the key thing, and, and that will help everybody, uh, everyone's outcomes, uh, ideally uh, help everyone's outcomes after surgery or or no surgery, as the case may be. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, I hope you're right, <laughs> because mm -hmm. I, I think it sounds like a buzzword, but I think precision medicine is something that's going to, it's it's more um, possible than I think people give it credit for. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, if there are no specific questions, I know, uh, someone had put something in the chat that I'm going to answer in a little bit, but I just want to thank Dr. Limbrick for being with us today and for answering these really cool questions about a lot of the research going on in Chiari and Syringomyelia. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on. And quite frankly, Dr. Limbrick, you're at the head of most of it. So I, I really am well, grateful you. for a lot of the work that you do. Like it's it's really excellent. And I, I will quickly nod to Tonda Meehan, who's been like amazing to work with for me. So uh, big, right, big. Right. <laughs> um, we we have a, a great, th thank you. We have a great team and uh, uh, Tonda is, is a key and Tammy, who you'll probably also know. We have a, we have a great team, but but all of it is sort of focused on the relationship of uh, a group of clinicians with you all and then, of course, the patients. So um, uh, I think that that's, that's the system sort of going from patient, patient advocacy group, uh, clinicians to science and then back the other direction. And, and, and that's what you guys are facilitating. So thank you all. Yeah. No, and I, I have a personal <laughs> vendetta, I guess you could call it almost, but that I think patients belong in science. So uh, I'm, I'm like a big fan of citizen science and I think it's really important. So right. any way that I can help. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks you. everybody for your attention. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs>